Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast, where we bridge the gap to Reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. And today is a book club episode with a repeat guest, one of our favorites, Dr. J.B. Fesco. And he's going to be talking about one of his brand new books, Adam and the Covenant of Works. And it's published by Christian Focus Mentor. And if you go on our show notes, you can find a link to Christian Focus and get a book for yourself. Get this copy. And you can find some other links like a, a Reformed Church near you to call home, as well as the Society of Reformed Podcasters, other like-minded podcasts out there, which we are a part of. So we'll jump right in and start talking to Dr. Fesco about his new book. Hey, glad to be with you guys, and uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll, we'll point this out on Twitter, because it's, it's always fun to do this. But you guys who are listening are going to hear this a little bit before the other episode that we just recorded. So technically we're doing this back to back, but you guys are hearing this a couple weeks later, a couple weeks before or later, one of those two. So they're, they're mm -hmm. not at the same time, but it's, it's fun doing this and, and having the, the same author on twice. If you guys listen to Dr. Lanier, we did kind of the same thing with him. So we're, mm -hmm. yeah, this is, I was, we were talking before I, I read the, um, the Trinity and Covenant Redemption book um, along this series. So we're, we're really excited to talk about this. Um, but I mean, just to kind of open it up with, with you, Dr. Fesco. So what, I know there's been a couple of works and you, you actually have another book on the covenant of works, um, uh, mm -hmm. with Oxford press. What's, what's different with this book on stuff that you've written before or other things written on the covenant of works specifically, or have they touched on Adam before? Yeah. Uh, the, the first one on the covenant of redemption, well, let me back up and say this is that I wanted to write on covenant theology, but there's a statement that Machen makes, and I think Machen says it, if my memory serves me correctly, in What is Faith, where he says, if anyone uh, aspires to make a lasting contribution to the doctrine of the church, he has to give due attention to its history, and so uh, I didn't want to repeat things. Uh, I wanted to really study it, and so I thought, okay, let me begin, and I'll start with the covenant of redemption, and so I wrote a book published with Vanden Hoek and Ruprecht, which is an academic publisher. The books are really expensive, so you're going to have to probably borrow it from a library or yeah. stand over, look over somebody's shoulder or ask <laughs> it for a Christmas present uh, and then return it when you're done with it. But mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, the, the Covenant of Redemption, Origins, Development, and Reception. And then I wrote uh, The Trinity and the Covenant of Redemption. And that one is the history and the other is the doctrine. Well, it's the mm. same kind of pattern that I've done here, where the Oxford Press book is the Covenant of Works, Origins, Development, and Reception, where it traces the history more or less from the patristics all the way to the contemporary period. And then in this book, it's about the doctrine. But that being said, in the Covenant of Redemption book, the, the, the doctrinal book, I more or less just kind of summarize the history in the opening two chapters. So it's more or less of a summary of mm -hmm. my history work. Whereas in this book, it's a little bit different in that uh, when I originally wrote the history book for Oxford, uh, at the time I didn't know that, you know, where I was going to publish it, but uh, the book was closer to 600 pages. Oh my gosh. And I thought, I don't know, you know, publishers are kind of, they get scared with bigger books like that and are like, oh, we'll never be able to sell this thing. Nobody's going to want to read a phone book. And so I split the book in half. And, it, you know, so what you find in the Oxford book is, is tracing it uh, historically, you know, from early church to the contemporary period. And so what I did is I took the other half of the book and I put it in the front end of this book, which is it covers the history, but it doesn't cover the history chronologically. It covers the, the history in terms of a series of topics that I later unpack and engage doctrinally. And so, for example, I have a chapter on the different terms that the covenant of works has gone by. Hmm. And then uh, I do a history of the exegesis of Leviticus 18.5, do this and live, because that's a key text for the covenant of works. I talk about Adam's faith and the question of, did, it, did Adam have faith and, and to what end? Hmm. Uh, one of the 
Uh, the next chapter is on covenant or contract because critics of the doctrine have claimed that, oh, the reformed uh, tradition has a contract, not a covenant, and the covenant of works is all about contracts. So I, I talk about that. The next chapter is on the question of grace and the covenant of works. Did Adam need God's grace and, and how does that un, uh, unfold? And then the last chapter in that section is, is the history of the covenant of works as it relates to the Mosaic covenant. Mm. So I unpack those things. And then in, in the second section, I unpack the exegesis of the covenant of works in eight chapters. And then the third section uh, deals with the doctrine where I give a statement of the doctrine and then talk about the covenant of works in Sinai, the doctrine of justification and the covenant of works. And then uh, grace and merit in the covenant of works. And then there's a, an excursus on uh, Genesis 126, uh, where I talk about some of those, the, the questions of the exegesis of that text and how it relates to the covenant of works. So, mm. so if you want the history, you get the Oxford book. If you want the doctrine and exegesis and, you know, stated uh, in a contemporary fashion, then you get this book, which, you know, it's published, it's going to be published and released by, uh, Christian focus or their mentor imprint mm -hmm. and God willing, I think it's supposed to be out in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So by the time this comes out, I think it'll be two days old. Okay, great. So for somebody that's not very familiar with the Bible or new to all this stuff, especially covenants and everything, why is the covenant of what is the covenant of works and why is it so important for us to understand? Yeah, the covenant of works is really important because it is the fundamental covenant in which all human beings are participants. And we are participants, all of us in this covenant, by virtue of the fact that Adam was our covenantal representative when God first created uh, the, uh, you know, the heavens and the earth. And you see this especially in Romans chapter 5, where Paul contrasts uh, you know, the respective disobedience of Adam and how God constitutes all who are in Adam as sinners. And then conversely, with the obedience of Christ, by which he constitutes those who are in Christ as righteous. And so when you see Paul putting Christ and Adam in parallel and their respective covenantal work, uh, then this is why it's so important that in this sense, we're all in covenant through Adam. And to put this in terms of salvation, we're all covenant breakers in Adam. And it's only the work of Christ, the last Adam, that undoes the curse of that initial covenant. And so, that, you know, that's why it's so important. So very basically, the, the covenant of works is the covenant between God and Adam when he commanded Adam to be fruitful, multiply, fill all the earth and subdue it, that was the blessing. But then conversely, when he said that he was not allowed to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day he would eat of it, he would surely die. That was the covenant curse. And as we all know, sadly, Adam violated, he broke the covenant, he broke God's command and uh, brought sin and death into the world. And so um, that, that in a nutshell is, is the covenant of works. Hmm. Yeah. And so you, you, you approach it. We kind of talked about it last time. Um, and I'm sure you get this question a million times. And we've gotten this question a million times, but it's always helpful to, to go through some of the basics. And we, our assumption is we have new people listening to this show every single time that we make it. So we want to make this very clear. So the word covenant doesn't exist mm -hmm. in the first three chapters, especially as it relates to Adam. So why make such a big deal about a concept that seemingly doesn't appear in the first few chapters of the Bible? Yeah, we want to take note of what's called the word concept fallacy that, you know, just because a word doesn't appear in the text doesn't mean that the concept is therefore absent. And the way that I illustrate this, as I said, is let's say that we were in a group of people and all of a sudden the phone rings and I pick up my phone and you, you only get to hear one side of the conversation and you hear me say, well, can the caterer come uh, at, the, at, at the time that we've established? Yes. Well, what about the groomsmen? Yeah, they'll be there on time. Uh, and the bridesmaids? Yes, they'll be there on time. Okay, what about the minister? Uh, and uh, do we have all of the invitations sent out? Yes. Okay, thanks so much for your phone call. As you hear all of those pieces of the phone call, I have never 
once used the word wedding. Mm -hmm. But with all of those, those pieces of the conversation, groomsmen, bridesmaids, caterer, invitations, minister, you've got all of the pieces of a wedding. And so you, you know, okay, he's talking about a wedding. And the, 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 the word doesn't appear, but the concept is present. Mm. And so when you read the opening chapter of uh, opening chapters of Genesis, all of the pieces of the covenant puzzle are present. And what you have to ask yourself is, is if you're a, an Israelite in the 15th century BC on the heels of the Exodus, and you are about to enter the promised land, and you hear uh, all of the covenantal uh, administration language in Deuteronomy, in the book of Deuteronomy, and especially Deuteronomy uh, 27 and 28, and you recognize because of Exodus 4.22 that God, Israel is as, as God's firstborn son, uh, and that Adam is a son of God because he's an image bearer, you're going to recognize, hey, wait a minute, there's a connection. There's, there, there are bookends here to the first five books of the Bible that as, as Deuteronomy, the last book of the Pentateuch, ends with the prophesied exile of God's son from an Edenic-like environment hmm. because of his violation of the covenant, that what you see in the large scale in terms of covenant apostasy, you see in a microcosmic scale with the expulsion of God's son, Adam, for his covenantal apostasy mm. in the opening chapters of the Bible so that Adam in covenant and Israel in covenant and their respective exiles both create the bookends to the Pentateuch. And this, is, this not only goes overall to what the scriptures teach, but it even informs us in terms of our reading strategy for the first five books of the Bible. And as Old Testament theologians have said, the Old Testament of the Old Testament is the Pentateuch, the first hmm. five books of the Bible. And so if you miss that reading strategy, I think you miss a lot uh, uh, that's in the Bible. And I think with that knowledge, it explains why Paul puts Adam and Christ in parallel in, in Romans 5, uh, why he puts them in parallel in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, why he says in Philippians 2 that Christ did not seek to grasp equality with mm. God, which is something that Adam sought to do. He mm, sought yeah. to grasp equality with God. And it basically gives us, you know, which we talked about this in the, la in the, the last episode, which <laughs> yeah. is now going to be the next episode. <laughs> yeah. And we talked about it in terms of it gives us the covenantal framework by which we can understand the respective works of the first and last Adams or mm. Adam and Jesus. Mm. And I think, um, I think a lot of the main objections and disconnects, and you can correct me if I'm wrong or add some, that a lot of uh, non-Christians would have on this topic would be because Adam and Eve, particularly we're talking about Adam because he is the, the head of this, uh, so long ago, uh, and we're comparing that to us here in AD 2021, how are we uh, affected by him doing a disobedient act um, so long ago? How are we biologically born into a sinful state when someone could say, well, it's not my fault he did that. Like, well, I feel like the innocent party. I was just born. It wasn't my choice to be born. Why am I born under this sin and under the covenant of works? And also they would say, uh, was Adam even a real person? You hear that a lot, like a lot of uh, skepticism on, on whether he was an actual true human being. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the first question goes to the fundamental nature of redemption itself people often want to say, well, I wasn't in the garden. I never chose Adam as my representative. Therefore, I don't want to have anything to do with him and I'm not responsible. And in one sense, that's a typical Western modern individualist mm -hmm. type of answer. Uh, and so in that sense, it's quite common. On the other hand, we, I, I, we say this is that if you reject Adam's representation because you were not in the garden, then 
by resistless logic, you must reject Christ's representation in his work and especially mm. on the cross because neither were you there either. Mm. Uh, you know, so uh, to reject Adam is to reject Christ and to reject Christ is to reject Adam. So, you know, you, you can't have it this way. And it's like John Donne's, uh, you know, 17, 16th century famous poet once said, no man is an island. And it's this sense that we uh, are inextricably linked one to another by virtue of our shared uh, nature as human beings. And this ultimately is what connects us to Adam, the first human being. Mm -hmm. The second observation or the second criticism, you know, strikes at the heart of the, the, the inspiration and the infallibility of the scriptures in that you know, granted, this is an anecdote, it's a short podcast, so we can't get into all of the details. But G.K. Chesterton once said that at the end of the age, when the scientists uh, finally climb to the top of the mountain of knowledge, they will find that the theologians have been sitting there the whole <laughs> time. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, yeah, science is unfolding. But the more that I study science, the more that I'm struck by the fact of quite Quite, quite stunningly how little scientists actually know about so much. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of unknowns. And so I'm not so worried about the so-called latest findings of science. Uh, I wanna say, let's wait and see what happens. And I have an unshakable uh, confidence in the word of God. And as the Westminster Confession of Faith says, not only because it most you know, powerfully evidences itself by its majesty, the consent of all the parts uh, and, and, and its beauty, but ultimately because of the corroborating uh, and uh, uh, testimony of the Holy Spirit, as well as the self-authenticating nature of the scriptures. And the scriptures tell us that Adam was a historical person. And it was John Murray who once observed and said, and he said this in criticism of Karl Barth and Karl Barth's denial of the historicity of Adam. How can you suspend a historical savior and a historical gospel upon a mythological foundation? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's, that's, that's a really insightful criticism. And so, uh, you know, we in the end either have to submit to the authority of scripture on this point uh, and then wait for the findings of science, not be worried and run off with the latest theory because the paradigms are always changing and so rapidly. Um, uh, or uh, we can embrace the latest scientific theories and continually have to adjust our paradigm because the scientific paradigms are always changing, especially when you consider the, the study of science uh, over um, over the last, say, you know, several thousand years. Hmm. Well, I don't think any of the scientific findings have disproved that Adam was a real human being either. Yeah, you know, there's there's variations on the themes. You know, some will say that Adam was a person, but that there were other human beings, or that there were pre-humanoid uh, types of human beings, etc. And that's where, you know, you'll see some of those types of claims. But what we always have to stand the line on is to say that, you know, God-given revelation says that he created Adam immediately with, mm -hmm. apart from ancestors. And, and while microevolution might explain some of the processes in, in the creation, uh, the Bible, I think, cannot be harmonized with, with macroevolution. And I know some noted, you know, uh, luminaries in the Reformed tradition have argued the other side of that 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 debate. No, notably, uh, you know, Charles Hodge and B.B. Warfield. But that's where I would humbly, you know, uh, and respectfully disagree with them and and say that there's I think there's a better way, you know, to go about that. Hmm. Yeah. And so towards the towards the end of the book on the on the third section and doctrine. So. Maybe getting on the on the hair more technical side, but I know I know it's um it's kind of a lightning rod topic in a sense within Reformed theology. So the the understanding of grace and merit in in the covenant of works. I know that's been kind of a bigger topic recently. So how how do you approach this? Because it comes right after your justification chapter in this. I'm assuming there's some sort of relationship between between those. How, how do you understand grace and merit? And if you can define that for the audience, say why 
maybe why is this potentially um, a lightning rod? And then how, how can we ground this in scripture doctrinally? I think that one of the, the you know, one of the questions that has always surrounded uh, any time you discuss the question of uh, the, the creation of Adam uh, is, you know, how could a finite human being secure an infinite blessing of eternal life? How does the finite creature, you know, uh, scale the, the yeah. height of yeah. inf infinity or heaven in that sense? And so at least for a, a large portion of the historic church, for whether it's Reformed or, or Roman Catholic, is they've said that, uh, that, that God gives Adam in some form, some form of grace. Uh, you know, call it what you will, a booster shot. Uh, and there's different versions of this. Yeah. Some Reformed theologians will say that, that uh, God graded Adam's work on a curve, that he boosted mm. the value of his obedience. Others will say that, no, God dispensed his grace to Adam. Uh, but yet one of the categories that I think helps us in this discussion is that the theologians that really applied the doctrine of the covenant to the original creation uh, and to Adam's context said they don't talk in terms of grace and neither do they talk in terms of the inherent worth or value of Adam's work as if a finite work could somehow merit or earn an eternal reward. Rather, they say that when God created, he created Adam in covenant, and he set the terms of the covenant. And the terms of the covenant are, if you obey, I'll give you this reward. It's not a question of, is the finite creature capable of this? And it's not a question of, of Adam somehow uh, making or earning something that is beyond him, but rather in the simplest of terms. Adam can do this because God said so. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the way that I account for this is I say that it's an act of God's love. It's an act of God's benevolence. It's an act of God's kindness. Uh, but that at this stage in redemptive history or pre-redemptive history, because sin has yet to enter into the picture, mm -hmm. it's not a manifestation of grace. Now, that being said, for those theologians that do want to invoke the category of grace, I say, properly defined, okay, I see what you're saying, and we're pretty close. But that being said, I, I, what makes me uncomfortable with using the category of grace is that you have to say it was resistible grace. Hmm. It was a defectible grace. It was an insufficient grace because Adam fell. Hmm. And it's different from the grace that we receive in Christ, which is irresistible, indefectible, uh, and, and, and it always accomplishes what God intends. And so you have to make those careful qualifications. And what I argue, too, is that in the post-Bardian age, where Karl Barth essentially subsumes all of theology under Christology— and washes out natural categories such as natural law or the covenant of works, we really need to be cautious as to how we talk about Adam's original state in the garden. And that's why I prefer not to invoke the category of grace, because when we invoke grace, or if we allow Christology to swallow anthropology, we inevitably, I think, do harm to a Chalcedonian Christology and we do harm to the man in the God-man. Hmm. Um, and so we need to be very careful with how we establish the covenant of works, because when we're talking about the covenant of works, we are ultimately talking about the person and work of the last Adam. Hmm. Uh, and mm -hmm. so that's how interrelated these, these, these topics are. Yeah. And something that struck me, too, is knowing that Jesus was under the covenant of works mm -hmm. and he achieved the covenant of works for us. So you're either under the covenant of works of, under Adam or you're under the covenant of works under Christ. Right. So either way you need the covenant of works to enter heaven. It's either 
it's on your own under Adam, which fell, which is imperfect because he he separated himself from God through disobedience, or it's for through full obedience through Christ. Mm-hmm. So that makes sense, and I I love that. Um, I also think of what I'm hearing too is pre-fall Adam was in a perfect state of relation with God, mm-hmm. still under the covenant covenant of works. Covenant of grace hadn't entered the picture yet. However, some people, I could totally see this, like they would say, well, even the act of creation, even the act of him, because God doesn't need to create anything to be any better. So even the act of creating Adam pre-fall was technically grace. So I could see people saying that. And pre-fall Adam was, is under the same cover of works as the angels, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, I think that, well, I'm, um, I would put it this way is to say that that whatever you say of Adam, because Christ comes under the covenant of works, you inevitably say of Christ. So if you say that Adam in his humanity has to have the grace of God in order to secure eternal life, then the God man, Mm -hmm. because he assumes an Adamic humanity, Mm. you have to say the same things about Christ. True, yeah. Uh, Son of man. Mm-hmm. And so you either have to say that there's an incongruity and that Christ as the God man does not have the same type of Adamic humanity as Adam mm-hmm. did because he's God and therefore does not require grace in order to accomplish the work. Mm-hmm. Or you, you say that, yes, the Adamic humanity is the same humanity or the pre-fall Adamic humanity is the same humanity that Christ uh, is you know that exists in in the in the hypostatic union, and so that's why you have to be you know have to be careful with these things. And there's this there's this connected there's this connected symbiotic relationship between them, and so uh, things can get can get dicey. And so that's why I say that the reason that God does not give Adam grace is because, uh, in the words of the Westminster Confession, you know he he gave Adam a will that was capable of obedience. He created mm-hmm. him good and upright, and he created him righteous. Uh, and to say as much about Adam is also to say as much about the humanity of Christ. Uh, yeah, so it's like, yes, it's the pre-fall Adam, even though he was uh, it was pre-fall, he he never had divinity in him like christ is the god man and adam is not god so even though he was in perfect state in the garden he still fell because he's just human and if we're in adam we're just human i mean we're still just human under christ but we are under christ's obedience and christ was able to fulfill the obedience because he was fully god and be our mediator because he's fully man yeah i think yeah Hmm. Yeah. So my, my last, my last question and, and kind of maybe to, to help tease some people into to getting the book and, and reading the book, but would be kind of just that. So what, what's something within the book, not necessarily that's new or um, anything people haven't heard about, what, but what's something that you can give people is like, Hey, here's, here's a, here's kind of a, an appetizer for the book. If you want the full mm-hmm. meal of what this book is, what's, what's maybe something that a nuance that people can think about that you've kind of brought out of the text or brought out some of these doctrines to say, Oh, that's, that's really, really good. I want I want to kind of pull that string a little bit further getting this book. Yeah. I mean, a broad observation and then I'll zero in on, on the specific question is that one of the things that I found in researching the history of the covenant of works is that there are tons of chapter treatments of it in various theological works but very few uh, monographs on the topic. As best as I've been able to uncover, there are maybe four or five books in the history of the Reformed tradition specifically devoted to the covenant of works. Not many at all. And so that I found is striking. And that was one of the motivations that that drove me to, to want to write one to say, there's a sense in which we have to recover the doctrine of the covenant of works, because while we affirm it, because of the paucity of books on the topic, we've often lost a number of its important elements. 
that we otherwise do not have. And one of those elements that I would regularly run across and that I've not really ever seen discussed that much in contemporary treatments of the doctrine of justification is invoking the doctrine of justification in the context of the covenant of works. Huh. And that like in one book on, the, on a biblical theology of the covenant of works, and most treatments do this, they go as far back as Genesis 15, 6. Okay, well, that's a good move. That's what Paul does. So there's no, no criticism there. But if we're doing a biblical theology of the covenants, we need to go back to Genesis 1 and 2. And we need to ask ourselves, where does the doctrine of the justification originate? And here's the fine tooth distinction. Is justification a soteriological or a doctrine of salvation? Or is as a part of salvation, or is the doctrine of justification first a doctrine of creation? And I would say that it comes in the doctrine of creation in the pre-fall creation, uh, and that what when God gave to Adam the, uh, the the covenant of works and the command, be fruitful, multiply, fill all the earth and subdue it, and don't eat from the tree, God was to come to him upon the completion of his labors and either declare him righteous or condemn him. In other words, to justify him or to condemn him, and that his justification would have ushered in, his righteous status would have ushered in the new heavens and the new earth. And so to put it in Voss, Vossian terms, and Voss has made this observation in the Pauline eschatology, um, eschatology precedes soteriology, or more, more simply, there is an end goal for the creation prior to the entrance of sin into the world and the need for salvation. And where then this means that justification first shows up in the Bible is in the Garden of Eden. And sadly for Adam and for all of us, uh, uh, Adam is not justified. He's condemned and cursed. But blessedly, in spite of our fallenness and Adam's disobedience and covenant apostasy, God sends his son, his faithful son, in contrast to Adam, his faithless son, uh, to do the work. And God therefore justifies him and declares him righteous. And as, you know, as, as Paul says in Romans 8.10, we have life in the spirit because of righteousness. In other words, the new heavens and the new earth have broken in upon the creation uh, and are dawning upon the old he heavens and the old earth because of Christ's justification. And so that's what I explore mm. in, in the chapter, one of the chapters there, justification and the covenant of works to talk about that whole idea that justification is a protological doctrine uh, or a doctrine of creation, not chiefly a doctrine of salvation. It's connected to our salvation, obviously, but it has roots that exist prior to the entrance of sin into the world. Hmm. I love it. Yeah. I don't, if, if that doesn't convince you to buy this book, I don't know. I don't know what will. That was, that was a great explanation. And I'm sure a lot of people are like, I like the Amazon or mentor just had a, a bunch of people just walk over this. So that's, that's, yeah, that's a, it's a great, yeah. I love that. I love that little teaser. Cause that's, that's something I haven't really thought about either. Yeah. Well, hopefully it proves to be a, uh, provocative in all the right ways totally yeah yeah it, it leads people to read not their their bible in a, a new and an unfathomable way but to see yeah that this has been the case since the very beginning of creation that we can we can track our justification even in adam's condemnation because we see in his condemnation that it points to this future justification so that's that's a it's a good word to to uh to end with so yeah, I don't know, Dr. Fesco, if you have anything that you want to end with, or um, Nick, if you have anything that you want to end with either. I'll just say thanks for having me on the show, and I hope that people find the, um, you know, find the book edifying and, uh, and helpful. Cool. Yeah, that was, that was wonderful. I'm excited to read it. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah, well, thanks for coming on, Dr. Fesco. It's been, it's been a pleasure having you um and yeah hopefully we can have you on again soon yeah have have fun with your family all right thanks a lot guys you take care and have a great rest of your day you too all right bye-bye